Welcome to the Bold SLP Podcast. We are so happy that you're here and can't wait to share with you all of the amazing conversations we've been having. We are the co-founders of the Bold SLP Collective, and we are also your hosts, Lisa, Desi, and myself, Ingrid. Each of us has a variety of experiences in all things bilingual and bimodal speech language pathology. You'll get to know us pretty well on here. We started this podcast to share our lived experiences, but also because we want to bring advocacy and cultural humility to the forefront of every speech therapy conversation. We hope that you'll join us each week, and we hope that you enjoy this episode. Welcome back to the Bold SLP podcast. This is season three, and we are so excited to kick off this season. I'm here with Lisa and Ingrid. And I have our very first guest of the season, Melanie Evans. So Melanie um, is, uh, we know her from Pediatric Speech Sister on Instagram, and she is going to introduce herself. Melanie, come on up. Yes. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, Like Desi said, my name is Melanie Y. Evans. I'm a bilingual speech language pathologist. Currently practicing in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm also licensed in Texas um, because I just moved from Houston. Um, And so Pediatric Speech Sister started out as a brand to help close the academic achievement gap. That's pretty much why I started the field. And it's just grown since I started. So I'm excited to see what happens next. Awesome. And you you just said you're currently in Oklahoma. Mm Mm-hmm. What uh what brought you to Oklahoma? So I was born and raised in Tulsa. Yeah, for 18 years I lived in Tulsa. Um, and then for college I left to Washington, DC to go to Howard University. Oh, okay. So how about we'll we'll just I'm gonna take you back. How about we just start from the beginning? Tell us about your journey to SLP um Ooh. and exactly how you became a bilingual SLP. Oh, okay. Um, so those are kind of two stories. Um Well, becoming an SLP, I actually did have speech therapy as a child. I was a late talker, considered a late talker. And then as I finally started developing my speech, I had, they said I had an accent. They thought I was from Boston, but really I just couldn't say my R sound very well. So, um, but after that, I graduated in third grade. So I completely forgot I even had a speech pathologist until it was time to go to college. And I said that I wanted to be the next Oprah and change the world. That's always what I would tell people. And um, basically my parents, Howard is very expensive. So my parents were like, are you sure you want to be broadcast journalism major? Are you sure you want to do this? Because you know you have to start at a lower pay grade and then work your way up in the field. So. Thankfully, um, the department chair of the COSD program came to my orientation class, talked about speech pathology, and I signed up. I made it my minor. I changed my major to organizational communications. And I'd like to say the rest is history, but um, not really, because when I started, I really liked the classes, like phonetics. Um, I was an undergrad, so I was just kind of going for different opportunities, and somehow it aligned for me to be more on the education track, even before I knew I wanted to be uh, education SLP. Mm-hmm. Um, I just happened to align there, so I started getting volunteer opportunities with education reform initiatives, and I was a United Negro College Fund Walton Fellow, and that helped me go to Chicago and learn about the education system there. So it was one of those things where it became my passion. So... Thankfully, I took a year off after graduating from college. I couldn't even imagine myself enrolling. So I knew that that wasn't good energy going into grad school. <laughs> so they let me defer my enrollment. Um, I went back and just did the education track. I didn't plan on working with children. It's the youngest I do. I work with elementary school kids primarily. Mm-hmm. And because I had a client in the university clinic and he was, in third grade and had ADHD. And of course he would come be coming right out of school and did not want to sit with me because my first client ever was an adult. So it was a weird switch. So I told myself that I would not be working with kids that young. And then I always say that God laughed and put me in a pre-K through third grade charter school for my externship. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that was, that was very rewarding. You, you went straight for it then. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I he just threw me in there, and it was at a Title One school in Washington D.C. Um, amazing experience, amazing supervisor. She's my mentor till this day, um, and thankfully, I just was able to get other opportunities that supported my overall mission. So here I am. Yeah. Oh, that's and good. then the bilingual oh. SLP. That's a whole other story. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm um, with the bilingual SLP part. I was working in Houston. I had my clinical fellowship and then I had another year um, in the schools. And my mentor, who I just mentioned, pointed me to a company that would fly me out to Guatemala to learn Spanish. I'd be out there for three months. I took Spanish online for a year before I went. And I did, of course, how to take some courses and get some training. And that's how I became a bilingual speech pathologist. So that has been a very challenging, but really, really rewarding at the same time, because oh. learning another language, especially in another country, I had a lot of learning curves. <laughs> yeah, maravilloso. I was going to say, um, I I really enjoyed how you mentioned that you started in this like advocacy, um, almost like you worked, you did your, uh, your major in CSD and you did this, these projects that were really centered on educational advocacy. Um, I feel like being a bilingual SLP is so much advocacy. I don't know, um, if that's been your experience where in the placements that you've had or the jobs that you've had. So a hundred percent that's, it's, I'm so passionate about it. That's why I just have to study because <laughs> honestly, um, even before I got this opportunity, I owed it to God because before I wanted to close the academic achievement gap specifically for Black and Latino children. Mm -hmm. And so it just so happened that during COVID, I got the Duolingo Plus membership and started <laughs> studying Spanish. I had no intention to get this. And it was at the perfect time when I was honestly tired of the United States anyway. I wanted an experience in Central America or South America to just descansar, like just rest. Um, and thankfully this opportunity came about. So I'm really grateful. I had a question because I hear you say academic achievement gap um, pretty often. So can you just maybe define what that is or what that means to you? Yes, yes. So in the United States system specifically, and I want to actually do more research on internationally, um, but specifically Black and Latino children, children of color, even Asian children, there's a significant amount of research that supports that there is exclusionary discipline. So basically they are being put on the school to prison pipeline and being kept away from their classes, from their peers, um, just because of cultural mismatches. And that's from my research that it's a cultural mismatch. Um, and so I got on this, or to answer your question, um, that is causing the academic achievement gap. Also, the fact that there are those linguistic cultural mismatches. For example, I always bring up how in African American English, we have our own communication styles, just like every culture does have their nonverbal ones and verbal ones, right? So in African American English, it's called loud talking. Um, and I have the book right here. Yeah, her name is Lisa Green, Lisa Green. Yes, African American English, she has a book. And so she mentions these different communication styles that African Americans typically have or culturally have. And one of them is called loud talking when you are telling a story and talking loud enough for other people to hear. Um, so of course in the schools that is unacceptable, it's disruptive. So um, teachers get fed up and start doing exclusionary discipline. And it's, it's really sad, it's really sad. And there's been a lot of movement to change it but the change is very slow. So. What I want to do is come from a linguistic standpoint, from speech pathology, and see how can speech pathologists change it. And also just as a communication scientist, how can we incorporate our communication skills to change this? Because I was also organizational communication major. So now that I'm saying it, it must just be how my mind is wired. <laughs> yeah, after school. But uh -huh, yeah, that's the academic achievement gap in the school and prison pipeline. It's, it's terrible in the States. Yeah, I was hoping you would mention the school to prison pipeline. That's the first thing that came to mind. Um, it's it's not so obvious to a lot of people, but once you say the words, 
and it's just sitting there. You start to think about it and you start to see it and you start to see the patterns, even if you're not a speech pathologist or a teacher or anything, you just, oh yeah, it's true. The prison is filled with people like this, youth like this, you know? Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to ask you was just, this is my last question, Desi. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you was about Spanish. So you learned it as an adult. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you yes. didn't speak any Spanish at all before. So I did the basics. I, in middle school, I took Spanish class. And honestly, I always tell people this just because it's a hundred percent true. I just remember learning about the colors, the months of the year. So that is an advantage. <laughs> the months of the year, um, the Donde Eres, that was a song that we got to do with the dance and watching Selena. So that was, and I took it for two years. I know, great movie. I took it for, I think, two years and we watched, that was like year by year. So basically, no, when I got to high school, I studied Japanese. I really liked Japanese culture. I wanted to go to Japan and thankfully I got to go to Japan. So I got to learn Japanese. Ask me if I remember a lot now, no. Um, after I feel more confident in my Spanish and feel like I've mastered it, I'm going to move on to learning Japanese again. I was yeah. going to say, that's really cool because you just, I, sometimes I feel like, um, okay, actually, let me go back. Full disclosure, I was a Spanish teacher, so. Okay, like, okay. Like, <laughs> that was my previous. That's a good disclaimer, thank you. Yeah, um, so it was funny, you kind of, yes, reminded me, I have all these flashbacks of like so many funny songs and acronyms and trying to, you know, help kids get, get there, um, but it's really cool to hear that you are interested in other cultures and in other languages. It's really refreshing. Um, I mean, and I think obviously like this is why you were such a, you know, good um, guest to have on because it's really amazing that you had that interest and you were able to pursue it. And I mean, you're realizing it in this, you know, by being a bilingual speech pathologist. So um, I wanted to ask, though, because you mentioned another thing um, in the form we had you fill out. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that you wanted to discuss the idea of owning your power as a BIPOC speechy. And oh, yes. can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, so I had an interesting experience after the fact because I came, I got my training in Washington, D.C. and Houston, Texas, two very predominantly just multicultural melting pots. So I didn't, even though I came from Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I left Oklahoma, I got a different experience of multiculturalism. So I haven't necessarily experienced racism or just that underlying implicit bias that you know is there, the cultural and historical implications to it, and also research on how trauma is stored in the body and how that really affects you. Um, because it got so bad in that environment. It was predominantly white and it was triggering to be in the environment because it was clear that they didn't really understand. Of course, they weren't intentionally trying to leave me out. They'd say, yeah, you know, come to come eat with us at lunch or whatever. But sadly, when I did decide to eat at lunch, I also got a microaggression. I would get microaggressions. I had a client say a white face joke, uh, not client, I'm sorry, a coworker, um, which makes it worse, <laughs> say a white face joke. So um, I left, I left that company. And so as far as owning your power as a speech pathologist, knowing that you have it, or as a BIPOC speechy, knowing that you have the, com I mean, have the power, you know, of course they invest it and I'm going to have to invest right back since I left <laughs> so soon but honestly it was worth it I can say that I really did earn the right to consider myself a bilingual speech pathologist um, especially as I keep doing my CEUs and my learning and my studying on that and my experience there helped me trust myself more because I knew in my spirit it was hard I was waking up at night it was a nightmare actually um, overworking it was a nightmare so um, when I quit, it's like doors just started opening up for me. I felt more creative. I had more energy to pour into myself and to my family and to my creative pursuits. And so just signaling that we don't have to try, we just are. 
And I think imposter syndrome tells us that we have to try. Well, let me just try to be this bilingual speech pathologist. Let me prove that I can stick with it for two years. Well, I'm not proving anything to anybody if um if my health is declining. And will I be here in two years? <laughs> will I get to say that? So that's that's the power right there. Um, I think that sadly culturally and especially just in the society, it's hard to agree that we matter, that we're worthy, because historically we've been told we weren't. And that also lives in our body. That's our experience, that's our parents' experience, our ancestors. So it, we have to remind ourselves that. And I really had to, it, was, it wasn't an easy decision. It was actually very tough, um, but eventually enough, had, I just had enough. So now I'm excited for this new journey in my life. I'm happy I made the decision when I did. Again, I just got to invest in my Spanish skills. <laughs> so, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I bet your students yeah. are so grateful you know, like it must light up their little faces to like know that somebody can connect with them on a different level. Um, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I've had that experience and it's really a special thing. And it's so interesting that you mentioned CEUs because I feel like we're always talking about it. You know, there's a difference between a, an SLP who is bilingual and a bilingual SLP who has training, who has knowledge about you know, bilingual language development. Um, so it's it's great to hear you mention that um, because it is just, it goes beyond just traveling somewhere or learning a language. And that's and just that's one just thing fun. I noticed is, you know, although we did have that, the bilinguistics trainings, we had that um, in non-disclosure, I'm not promoting them, <laughs> but <laughs> non-disclosure. Um, but you know, we did have bilinguistics training, so I do have a uh, a certificate in cultural linguistic diversity. At the same time, it's kind of where it stops there. For it, I could tell just the just the vibe. I just knew um, there's one situation where we got to basically we had someone who was in a new position. She was the director of speech now, and she brought up an amazing idea that we should all go around and again, non-disclosure, informed SLP, find articles on informed SLP to discuss to each other. So when I'm looking at our shared Google Doc and I'm seeing the articles that my colleagues are choosing, and none of it had to do with bilingual development or anything about like the culture of the people who were serving and working with. They would, it was almost like it was a blow off college assignment to them. Like, oh, you know, this looks cool. Let's look up, I don't know, random language sample analysis, not necessarily bicultural or whatever, but let's just look up language sample analysis just to say pretty much that we have something to talk about at this meeting um, or just other interests, which is fair. At the same time, I was shocked to know that I was the only one that was actually really excited to go in and look at all the different articles that they have on that site um, about multiculturalism and how we can serve our population because it's low income, predominantly Hispanic. And there is one client who had trauma because his father, they don't know where his father is, um, and he had to experience the immigration detainee camp. And I noticed that on his report and I wanted to ask for resources for them. And this is just long story short, but ask for resources for them and put it out in the lobby, really make it fancy. I didn't want to just have like a list of numbers and then add it to a joint Google Doc that we all have, which is what I was instructed to do. But I wanted to have almost like a flyer, like, hey, if you've been through this, because they, most of them probably have, this is it. And so I got some pushback on that. There are some power struggles there. Um, again, though, this disheartening because I'm just trying to do the work. I'm just here to do the work. So it was messing up with my moral compass too. We talk about this amongst us here all the time, right? Um, trying to figure out ways to reach people, do the work of advocacy, um, you know, really get build alliances. And that's almost the trickiest part. I, I re recognize that I could probably work myself into the ground and I still might not be able to build that alliance with somebody else. Um, and I'm not, I haven't figured it out how to do that. Um, it's something I'm always working on, but you know, it's, it's good to hear that you recognize that there was a power struggle and that you've kind of figured out, you know, maybe this isn't the place for me. 
I love that you're you're not about wasting time. Like yeah. we have a limited time have here. There's a bunch of articles we could be reading that could actually make a difference in our field for these children. I love that. And even in the the research we're doing right now for the course, like all these articles have existed for decades, you know, and we just yeah. never heard of them because they were never put to the forefront. These were things that people cared about, people like you, people like us, you know? Um, yeah. Desi, you would mention that like, it's so empowering probably when Melanie, when you walk into a room and, and you're bilingual and the kids feel like they can connect with you, but just, mm -hmm. just the way you look and, and the, like the glow that you have, I don't know how to explain it because it's a podcast, mm -hmm. but I, I'm sure <laughs> you feel thank you. that energy, you. you know? So yeah, I just had to mention that. No, thank you so much. And what's sad and really what's sad is you, even my parents noticed a difference from when I was there working there and versus now they can just see the night and day. And it's kind of sad when at work, I'm feeling kind of my worst, but of course I'm putting on a face, trying to leave, sadly leave work at home <laughs> in a way, you know, not bring in the emotions I have when I'm off and back into the next day. Um, and then I had a colleague, she was an OT and she was just like, I just love your energy. And I said, thank you so much. Cause I feel like I've been crappy actually. And that's just a nice way of saying it. I didn't feel like myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. It, that was very validating because it was, it was a hard decision again. It wasn't easy, but, um, when I saw the physical manifestation with my hair and I wasn't getting any sleep, that was the red flag. I'm like, and I didn't even have time to get my hair done because I was at work all the time. And oh. now hairstylists, they know their worth too. They don't want to work on the weekends. <laughs> they're like, we don't have to do that. So, <laughs> so they, I, you know, there were no Saturday appointments. So it was one of those things where I had to choose myself or just the checkbox. I was going to stick it out. Let me just stick it out and see if I can do this. Um, but then I had a colleague who we didn't even become friends until after she announced she was quitting because we got to sit down and just have a real moment with each other. And I'm like, wow. And she's Filipina. So, and she stuck it out for six months, but she had a longer contract too. And it was so bad that she had to take a break from the field. Wow. So I'm just like, wow, you're not coming back to speech pathology. She's like, no, like, honestly, she's like, I'll be fine working at Marshall's at this. Point. The fact that she's a person of color and there's not a lot of us represented in this field. And it's kind of like, I wonder why. So this experience in and of itself really challenge me to think about what imposter syndrome really means, especially for people of color, especially for women of color, um, because, yeah, just how we're treated in this field and the pressures that we put on ourselves culturally, you know, we do it for our families too. So then when we do the same thing for our workplace, one thing that's helped me is looking at our jobs like they are relationships, just like any relationship. It's almost like a marriage, right? You sign a contract to get married. You're signing, you're there 40 hours a week. It's a marriage, it's a relationship. And so if it's a toxic relationship, you're not gonna stay. If you're working your tail off and you're not seeing any effort on their end, not even in your bank account, then <laughs> honestly, you just don't see any return really. Um, is that really something that you want? For yourself so I I don't know if that's the best way but it makes sense to me to look at as a relationship because again once my skin started breaking out my hair started falling out I wouldn't stay in a romantic platonic relationship like that where I'm going through those things so yeah same thing with my job and again once I started thinking of it that way more of my dreams just it just flooded just ideas and inspiration and action and of course it's hard because I went into full-time entrepreneurship so of course it is that's a whole other journey in and of itself but it's so worth it compared to what the potential of it is great mm -hmm. so yeah I 10 out of 10 recommend do it I wish I did it a bit smarter financially thank god that it didn't it didn't kill me but I wish that I even had, or that I would have planned even sooner. Cause I knew, I really knew I had that intuition. Like I really knew before I even went into it. Um, but I felt like I was already committed. And so if I would have planned it, I would have felt more cushiony and felt less pressure just on myself. 
if you have the opportunity to just plan it out, I wish that I would have been a bit more graceful about it and just graduated my kids early who, who really could have just been graduated and just done it gracefully like that. But it was to the point to where, like you said, Lisa, time is precious. Like it's precious. I didn't have it <laughs> at that point. So through a lot of us are going through that same burnout and moral injury at our workplaces. So we went through something really major in 2020, like pandemic wise, like all coming together. And then, yes, we're so committed to doing better. And then I see that it was all for show for a lot of people. And it's really disheartening. And lots of people were just like running through the motions. I think the pandemic gave us the whole like quiet quitting or, you know, just, just really like moving on. Right. Um, like, wait, what was the Beyonce song? It was <laughs> at least your job. Is it that? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you know, and it's just, yeah, like it gave people permission to just like move on. Right. Like there were so many bigger things going on in the world. Um, and now we're in this like funk, right. In society with all of the different, political socioeconomic things going on and I think that yeah it's it's at a we're back to the point where like now everyone's kind of being flexed to the extreme um and um it's nice to hear that you've kind of carved your way out of that um and it sounds like you also you said have kind of started on your entrepreneur voyage um so can you tell us about that I know um you've got some exciting stuff going on with your brand Yes, yes. So um, where do I even begin? Honestly, there's so many amazing things happening. Um, I really started this in 2021 because just like what you said, Ingrid. Okay. In 2019, I started my page as a business page. It was just a business Instagram. My mentor, who I mentioned before, said, oh, also, by the way, Dr. Valencia Perry was on the podcast. That's one of my mentors, too. So we do, yes, we do research together and everything. I love her. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and she's another mentor who I'm going to mention because there are so many things happening. And in 2020, after George Floyd happened, I created a post that said five ways speech pathologists can support black and brown kids in clinical and educational settings. That post blew up, got like a thousand and something likes, and I just started getting all of these followers. And after that, I started just doing more educational posts. And I'm like, wow, this is really a need. And everyone was really into it, really fired up. But just like what you said, Ingrid, everything just kind of started dying down after a while and you know the people who were listening just kind of started falling off or it was few and far between um and I also feel that since I was working so much I couldn't I didn't have the time to pour into this passion of mine um which is the mission of pediatric speech sister but to pour into the schools which I liked the schools and I still like the schools don't get me wrong of course but it's hard when you're trying to change something from the inside, especially from my experience as an employee. There's just not a lot of freedoms there. You're in a very well-oiled machine and there are certain rules that you have to abide by. Um, you're part of the system, sadly. So when you're trying to change it, so that was getting that was getting to me too. Um, but so now that that is, I guess I can say out the way as an entrepreneur, I'm still gonna be working in the schools, um, but as a private contractor, as an independent contractor, and that will really project everything else. I'm not going to say everything, but there are books on the way, the five ways to support black and brown children. That's going to become a book and introduction to cultural compatibility. Um, it's been an amazing experience so far. I've gotten to present with Therapy Insights and Credit Institute with AC Goldberg. And so I'm just excited to share more of this information with the world. Also on the side, I am a Praxis strategy coach. So I got to have experience as a Praxis tutor, the private company that I was working for. It was almost like the same thing, y'all. It's so sad how they do speech pathologists because we're the only ones who could do what we do. And so essentially I, I'm the only one who can tell someone how to do what I do um, as the tutor, right? But they were paying like 25 an hour 
which during that summer, there was one summer when I was off of school, it was, it was fine. But then after a while, I realized it wasn't sustainable for me. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I'm like, I don't know if I want to get out of bed for 25 an hour, which is a blessing to say, but honestly, if I'm pouring in, I also poured into my clients. Were you a so contractor for them? Mm -hmm. I was an independent contractor for them. At $25 an hour. Oh my word. And yeah, you're paying all those employment hour. taxes. Ah. No, 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 no. So that was a learning experience, but it also allowed me to be more creative with how I earn income from it. And yes, so Praxis Speech Sister is like the baby of pediatric speech sister. Um, and that's on Instagram too. Amazing things happening. Awesome. And yeah, we'll definitely tag all of these things that you're mentioning um, in the show notes. Um, I'm just, we're going to start wrapping up soon, but is there, of all the projects that you have going on, um, is there one that you're really excited about? I notice when I try to do the business stuff, I always still gravitate towards the more creative side of things. So the Pediatric Speech Sister Show podcast and also the Pediatric Speech Sister Network, which is just a series of lives. Um, every single Saturday, I do a live with another industry leader, and we just, it's almost like a collaboration roundtable discussion on different ways that we can make the field more culturally competent um, in every area and just brainstorming different ideas on how to close the academic achievement gap. I also have Praxis Speech Sister Tuesdays where we talk about strategies on passing the Praxis exam and also with just getting through grad school because a lot of the strategies are the same. Um, and then also we do have on Sundays, that's going to be starting very soon. It's Sunday Speech Sister Live and it's more spiritual topics. Um, so I will be bringing up imposter syndrome and just talking about it from a spiritual lens. So pretty much what this episode was and how I was talking about the job. It's conversations like that. I'll be a bit more free spirited when it comes to talking about my faith and everything. Um, but with the other channels, I understand that not everyone has that point of view. So I do want to be respectful and still get the information out that I need to get out, you know? So yeah, so there's something for everybody. And that's something that everyone could really look for this summer. Super, super exciting. Well, um, I think what we'll do now, if everyone's feeling ready, I think we'll get ready for last words. Um, so I have a word in mind. Um, I have stuck in my head um, the word enough. Mm. Um, you know, we we talk about, you know, how we're speech pathologists. We talk about all this training we go through, um, all the continuing ed we pay enough money in fees and licensure and all that, um, you know, and I think that at the end of the day, like you said, we still, a lot of us, so even some of us who are, you know, are trying to do our best by people who are different than us. It's like this overwhelming sense of imposter syndrome. Sometimes I know when you were just talking right now about working within a system, I really felt that in my bones today. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think hearing you say, that we are enough, uh, believe it or not, was such a big deal to me right now. Um, I this It was just exactly what I needed to hear today. So thank you. <laughs> That's something I always still have to remind myself, but I just noticed that that weight is heavy on our shoulders as, as a person of color in the field when it's predominantly white. It's it's just what it is, even as people who've been practicing forever. I was doing a live on imposter syndrome and there's someone who's a clinical fellow. She's either a clinical fellow or in grad school. Um, and she said, does imposter syndrome ever go away? Like as you get more experience. And I laughed and I said, no, <laughs> you just get better at handling it. <laughs> because there's always going to be something new that you're trying. There's always, you know, as you're growing, hopefully your values are changing too. And hopefully yourself, like hopefully you're just always evolving. So you're always going to be doing something better than you did before. Um, and so how I explained it, it was like you're having a power trip with your ego. Your ego's like, no, stay. Like, yeah, it's kind of cold out there. And then there's a higher self that's like, I, I got a jacket. We'll be good. You know, so that <laughs> that um, I noticed that we really go through and I'm excited to do more research on it. So that way it doesn't just kind of seem like which. 
I almost hate to say it like this, but just seem like a, like another person of color just complaining and trying to say, what was me, what was me, but actually studying the research behind it, even as deep or psychological of how trauma is stored in our bodies and how that is a generational cycle. I'm reading my grandmother's hands right now, um, which 10 out of 10 recommend, but it just talks about other certain DNA codes. So I really want to also introduce that to our field too and talk about it more. So that way we can be harmonious. You know, I think the best way to bring inclusion, which I'm on a soap, I'm on a, I'm on a soapbox. <laughs> um, but one way to bring inclusion, I'll say this, just one way to be include to bring inclusion into our field is accepting that we are here. And that's something that I am still learning. But once we all just accept that we're here, I think that we can really move forward. So I'm ready to find more science to back that up. I agree that imposter syndrome doesn't go away, but we could choose to not listen to it. I I feel like I don't have it anymore. I don't, I wouldn't believe it's a thing anymore. Not for me. Um, my word is worthy. It's, mm. I'll leave it at that. You both stole my words. I had written them like enough, worthy. <laughs> Luckily I had others. Um, I'm going to really take away that moral fatigue concept you mentioned. I was like, what is that? I was like searching. I've never heard it before. So I guess my I last word would be all like something new, just learning a new way to call my feelings. I love it. And I have to really quick give the credit to Rebecca Von Dereg. She goes by gender affirming voice on Instagram and I think I mentioned burnout because then she sent me an article on moral fatigue and there, there's a difference. There's a difference. Yeah. So I actually get to talk to her this month about, about what exactly that is and how speech pathologists go through it. She said, I'll be talking about the science. I'm excited. You were, yeah, you mentioned it and I was like searching. There's like a lot of research on it for nurses, mm -hmm. moral exhaustion. Yeah. And I guess it's yeah. a thing that's been researched. It goes back to what we were talking about. Um, I had so many thoughts when you guys were talking earlier. I wrote about dual language education when I was an undergrad. And the research was there then. The research has been there since then. And still every day, it seems like you hear someone prioritizing English over every other language. And I'm just like, oh. Like you're every day, every day, someone mentions something, someone signs a letter somewhere, someone sends an email, just like undermining bilingualism left and right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, we have known. I don't understand. But I will take that uh, moral fatigue concept away and do the thing that I do and research it and learn more about it. Exactly. Um, my word is refreshing. I didn't, I haven't publicly spoken about this experience, so it feels good to do it on y'all's platform, really. So thank y'all for holding the space for me to talk about it. Um, I feel very refreshed. It was very cathartic for me. Well, I'm so happy that you feel that way. Um, I think we all feel really refreshed and honored that you made some time to come um, and join us. Um, so uh, we will definitely have all of your contact information in the show notes. Um, I will type out um, some details about all the wonderful things you have going on. Um, and thank you for the book recommendation that will be in there too. But um, I really hope that we can catch up again soon. Thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you all so much. It was such a great conversation. Thank you. Hi, before we let you go, we wanted to share with you something that we've been working on behind the scenes. It's a really exciting collaboration with SLP Nerdcast. We are creating a four week grad credit course with them to be released for the summer of 2023. All of us three together are working on this course that means so much to us. It'll be solutions and strategies to prevent harm in bilingual and multicultural evaluations. It's going to be so, so great, and we are so thrilled to be working on it. Uh, we can't share it with you yet, but it's ready for pre-order. So if you want to check it out, um, go to our bio on Instagram or to our website.
Thank you for listening and supporting the Bold SLP Collective. You can find a closed captioned version of this podcast on our YouTube channel. We will also have show notes on our website. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do all the podcast things. Follow, subscribe, download, and review. And don't forget, we love hearing from you. So connect with us on Instagram at the Bold SLP Collective. Stay bold and humble. See you next time.